It's June 2009, and protests are erupting across Iran. People are unhappy with the results of a recent election and are assembling in Tehran. Neda Aga Sultan is stuck in her car in a traffic jam caused by the protests. She's sitting next to her friend when she decides to step outside and get some fresh air. Suddenly, a gunshot rings through the air. A nearby sniper from a government-funded militia. Netta falls to the ground beside her car. Her friend rushes to her aid. Netta looks over at her friend and mutters her last words. It burned to me. Burned to me. Burned to me. Netta's death makes headlines around the world. She becomes a symbol for Iran, representing the struggle they faced against their newly elected president. Over the coming days, the protests grow larger and more violent. 300 kilometers south of Tehran is Natanz nuclear facility. This is the headquarters for Iran's nuclear program, where they're working on building a nuclear bomb. And just days after Netta's death, the CIA has given approval to infiltrate Iran's nuclear facility. The latest version of a worm that the CIA has been programming is being uploaded directly onto Iranian hardware inside of the Natanz nuclear facility. This software was designed by the U.S. as a part of a government-sponsored cyber warfare program. The CIA has been working closely with Israel for years to design what is now known as the world's first digital weapon. The malware is called Darksnet. And even though a new version of this program is being uploaded in the midst of the Iranian controversy, Stuxnet has already been wreaking havoc to their system for years. But this new version of Stuxnet is designed to deliver the final blow. You are watching this one. 2006, Washington, D.C. A man carrying a bag filled with broken metal walks into the White House. He arrived earlier that day from a top secret U.S. laboratory called Oak Ridge, located in Tennessee. He walks directly into the Situation Room, approaches the President, and empties the contents of the bag he carried with him right onto the desk. Broken metal and frayed components strewn across the conference room table. The man looks at the President and says, We did it. He was referring to the software they'd been programming. The metal shrapnel was what was left of a centrifuge that had exploded. This centrifuge was once eight feet tall and 10 inches in diameter, made of steel. Its purpose was to enrich uranium in order to create a nuclear bomb. This was the first time in history that a computer program was used to cause physical damage to another piece of hardware. In this case, the damage was so extensive that it caused an eight-foot steel cylinder to explode under pressure. As soon as the president heard this news, he gave immediate approval for Stuxnet to become the strategy for sabotaging the Iranian nuclear program. Years earlier, the U.S. had intercepted these centrifuges from Libya. They were sold to Libya by a man named A.Q. Khan. 
the U.S. received intel that Khan was providing Iran with the exact same centrifuges. So the U.S. built an entire replica of Iran's nuclear facility in Tennessee. They studied how these centrifuges worked for years. The purpose of this was to design a way to sabotage the hardware in Iran's facility without detection. So the first version of Stuxnet is approved and released in 2007. Stuxnet. Iran has filled their entire nuclear facility with thousands of these centrifuges. Uranium hexafluoride gas is placed inside of each centrifuge. The centrifuge then spins this gas, eventually reaching supersonic speeds. The purpose is to separate isotopes, which will then enrich the uranium. But when the uranium becomes enriched, the pressure that builds needs to be released through the valves. The plan was for Stuxnet to infiltrate the computers that modulated these centrifuges to keep these valves from opening. If the valves are left shut, this will cause the uranium gas to solidify, which will then cause the centrifuge to spin out of control. While this is happening, there's a buildup of pressure that's unable to be released from the centrifuge. This will eventually destroy the system entirely, and in some cases, can cause the centrifuge to explode. But besides causing physical damage to the equipment, this wasted the uranium Iran was trying to enrich, and they had a limited supply. The problem is that Iran's facility is air-gapped, so their network is offline. Because of this, Stuxnet will need to be uploaded directly onto the computers that modulate the centrifuges via USB. This requires the help of an inside person. Once the malware infects the computers, it needs to operate in the background for a long period of time, collecting information. But it needs to do this undetected. To do this, Stuxnet uses a rootkit to hide its files from the operating system to evade detection as it operates silently in the background. After this, it will need to use a stolen digital certificate to sign its commands so that they appear to be coming from a trusted source. This way, any hardware malfunctions are just logged as hardware issues instead of a software error. But as Stuxnet operated for the first two years, the reports that came back to the U.S. indicated that although Stuxnet was effective at slowing progress, Iran was still progressing. Over the last two years, researchers at Oak Ridge have been working to make Stuxnet more efficient. The first version of the worm operated by using only a single zero-day exploit. In this case, this was a bug in the Windows Auto Run feature that Stuxnet exploited. But this new version of Stuxnet was somehow using four zero-day exploits. This was the first time in history of malware that any worm has used this many zero days. Somehow, Stuxnet was using private keys that were stolen from two separate manufacturers in Taiwan in order to sign its digital certificates. After the computer was infected, Stuxnet would move to override the software that controlled the centrifuges by altering the files. It did this so that the systems that monitored the speed of the centrifuges would not detect when any hardware began malfunctioning. This would prevent the software from shutting anything down. After this, Stuxnet would infect the actual centrifuges to reprogram the speeds they would spin at to eventually destroy the industrial control system. This was the backbone of the system that ran the centrifuges. 
The problem the CIA ran into was that because Stuxnet needed to spread via USB and then Aton's system was air-gapped, the malware wasn't making it onto all the right computers. And this was the reason they developed an even more aggressive version of the malware. A worm that infected every system it came into contact with. This was Stuxnet. An employee of the Natanz facility is flipped and agrees to carry in the new version of Stuxnet on an infected computer. This new version is designed to spread rapidly across the Natanz network. It's programmed to be aggressive. The CIA needs to ensure that Stuxnet is reaching the right computers so they don't waste any more time. The worker arrives to Natanz with a new version of Stuxnet in hand, walks into the facility and sits down at their desk. They open their computer and connect to the local network. As soon as this happens, the new worm begins to spread. Stuxnet spreads so rapidly that it quickly infects every computer that's on the Natanz network. The issue was that some of these infected computers were then carried outside of Natanz and connected to other networks. But because this version of Stuxnet had been programmed to be extremely infectious, the malware began to spread across the entire country of Iran. But it didn't stop there. Stuxnet started to spread across the entire globe at an alarming rate of speed. Stuxnet was no longer contained. The CIA receives intel that Stuxnet is out of control, and a briefing is held immediately, back in the Situation Room. It was decided that nothing could really be done to stop the spread. So the decision was made to carry on and wait, and hope that Stuxnet would go undetected inside of Natanz. But shortly after this, Symantec discovers the malware and publishes a 64-page report on the research they've conducted. They then make this report public. Because of this report, Iran puts the pieces together and announces they're aware of the attack and have taken precautions to guard against future ones. They commit to continuing on with their program despite the immense setbacks. Over the coming years, almost every high-ranking scientist working on Iran's nuclear program is assassinated. Car bombings become a regular occurrence for physicists and leaders of the program. One after the other, they are eliminated until finally the director of the Natanz nuclear program dies in a bombing. To this day, Stuxnet is considered a masterpiece. Some say it was the most sophisticated malware ever designed. Although it may not be solely responsible for dismantling the Iranian nuclear program, it definitely played a role. Developers of Stuxnet are still unnamed.